So I go straight to the first speaker of the day, who is Mark Sampson from Oxford University. And Mark will give us a talk entitled Water and Ions in Membrane Nanoports and Channels, Insights from Molecular Simulation. Mark, when you please. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, a great pleasure um, to be speaking at this meeting and, and I thank the organisers for inviting me and of course my only sadness is that I'm, I'm sitting at my desk at home uh, and not in beautiful Rome for the meeting so may, maybe sometime in, in, in the future. The work I'm going to talk about today is some of the work that has gotten on in my group over the past few years looking at a problem that we first examined so, some while ago which is the behavior of water in ion channels and membrane nanopores and particularly uh, the concept of hydrophobic gating and before um, I, I, I start the talk itself I'd just like to introduce some of the people who've worked on this recently um, three graduate students all now ha have their doctorates sort of have moved or are moving on to other things. Uh, Gemma Trick in the earlier days, Jani Klesser, who's now work, working in, in Germany for Merck, uh, Shannon Rao, who will hopefully start a postdoc soon, and also a very um, talented postdoc in my group, Charlotte Lynch, who's been part of this project. Uh, and this, a lot of this work has been in collaboration with two uh, colleagues, my long-term collaborator over, over, over now, probably most of a couple of decades, um, Stephen Tucker, in, who's in biological physics in Oxford, uh, and more recently, Sudha Chakrapani and her structural biology group at Case Western University. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll now proceed uh, and I'll say a little bit about what we're doing. So the idea of hydrophobic gates is, summarized in, in in this diagram here if you think about a, a channel or a nanopore in a membrane you have water on either side the membranes in green here's the channel and um the channel will probably be narrower in the central region and will be filled we expect with water in the liquid state but under certain circumstances if this central region is sufficiently narrow and sufficiently hydrophobic then it won't support water stably in the liquid state, but rather you will have a what's sometimes referred to as a vapor gap or um, a dry region that is empty of water molecules, exemplified here. Um, and so our basic question is, can such a, a band of hydrophobic residues we see in a, a, a couple of structures that were studied early on, um, a mechanosensitive channel and, and a bacterial a member of the pentameric ligand gated ion channel family, you see regions which are narrow and hydrophobic. So yellow here indicates hydrophobic side chains. You have a region with a hydrophobic band surrounding this um, narrow pore. And the question is, can that act as a trans, as a gate in such a pore by um, expelling water and so um, providing an energetic barrier to iron permeation. Uh, and this is actually something that we developed theoretically a, a little while ago, um, back at the, the, the start of the, the century. This is the work of Oliver Beckstein, who now has his own group at University of Arizona, uh, and, and others um, working on similar problems at the same time. And we're applying this um, now to look at the many new structures of iron channels that are emerging. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the theory, how we can apply it to ion channel structures, uh, and, and then sketch out how we've developed this into a pipeline for annotating very quickly new ion channel structures. I'll give a, a couple of examples of that, and, that, and how that's enabled us to do um, a global analysis of um, a substantial number of the structures that, that now available for channels. So this illustrates the, the, the early work um, that Oliver Beckstein and others did. And this, we didn't have any 
high resolution structures for channels then. So we took a, a very simple model of a nanopore, the, the blue in the background here are hydrophobic particles of the, the overall width. It's about the width of a lipid bilayer. Uh, we have a narrow pore and we can control the hydrophobicity or polarity of the particles lining the pore. And as you can see, water will enter that pore, but it will also spontaneously exit as well. So the pore exhibits reversible wetting, de-wetting. And we can look at the um, density of water within the pore as a function uh, 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 of time and as a function of the pore radius. And so this is going from a wider pore that spends most of its time in the wet state to a narrow pore that spends most of its time de-wetted. And so if we look at the yellow light points here, for a purely hydrophobic pore, we can see that there's a cutoff radius of about um, half a nanometer, whereby the pore switches from fully hydrated and therefore permeable to ions to de-wetted and therefore impermeable. And we can switch between that therefore functionally closed state and functionally open state, either by varying the radius or by varying the polarity. So if we increase the polarity of the pore, then we switch from de-wetted to wetted, from functionally closed to functionally open. And you can understand a little bit more about what we mean by this vapor state just by a, a simple calculation of um, what's the volume here uh, it's of the order in such a gate region of about a nanometer cubed. That should, if you had liquid water there, that would be about 30 or so waters. If you had a vapor state, then you'd expect essentially zero waters there. So the liquid vapor equilibrium is essentially one between wet and dry in this region. And so, as I said, Oliver Beckstein and um, others, so um, Rosalind Allen working in Jean-Pierre Hansen's group in Cambridge at the time was doing very similar work, came up with this model of hydrophobic gating in, in, in model nanopores. And the, then the question was, did this operate in ion channels? And at the time it was rather difficult to say because there were very few high resolution structures available. We had a little bit of a look at um, a low resolution model of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor um, from Nigel Unwin's work in Cambridge, that was what prompted these original theoretical investigations. Uh, and a number of others pursued this in other channels. So I know Sergei Sukarev ha ha had a look at um, a mechanosensitive channel, uh, uh, and Gerhardt, who, who you will hear in the next talk, explored this extensively for bacterial um, uh, ligand-gated ion channels. But what's become possible more recently is to look at it in a range of different high resolution channel structures. And, and so we revisited this theory when a structure came out at um, a reasonable resolution. This was from X-ray crystallography for a ligand gated ion channel for a serotonin receptor, a 5-hydroxytryptamine 3 receptor, 5-HT3 receptor. Um, and at the time of the publication of this, um, the authors were quite cautious to say it was not clear whether this channel was in an open or a closed state. And if we look at a slice through the structure, so this is just looking through the narrowest region in the central transmembrane pore, as with many of the channels in this family, there's a narrow region corresponding to a ring of leucine residues. And in the nomenclature for the, 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 this family of channels, this is referred to as leucine nine prime. And that ring of leucine residues gives a narrow and hydrophobic region. So our approach was to simulate the structure of, of this transmembrane pore. We, we, we restrain it slightly because we want to stay close to the experimental structure. And then we ask, does this experimentally determined structure um, wet or de-wet? What's the density of water within this pore? And that will give us a proxy, as we'll see, for whether ions can permeate the pore. So we did that here. This is for a 500 nanosecond simulation. Uh, uh, and what I'm plotting here is literally plotting the positions of all the different water molecules, most of them in, in, in pale blue as a function of time, and then of occasional ones in, in darker blue, just to show the trajectories of individual waters as they diffuse back and forth across the pore. 
And what you can see is that the, um, in this central region, there's a considerable drop in the number of waters in that region. And, th and this is a, the number of waters on a logarithmic scale. So bulk water at either side, but we can see a very small number of waters actually sit in this hydrophobic narrow region. And what we can do is, is relate that to an energetic barrier. This is from um, uh, umbrella sampling, potential of mean force calculations for either sodium or for chloride. We can see that the dehydration, the de-wetting of this region leads to a considerable barrier to iron permeation. So that rather supports our idea that we can look at water density as a, a proxy for, for what the, the um, iron channel free energy profiles will be. And of course, we can calculate the water density much more quickly and more robustly than we can estimate these free energy profiles. And indeed, this is a, a shown in pale blue as a free energy profile for water estimated from the density in this simulation. So what we've done then is, um, and this is particularly the work of Jeanne Klesser uh, 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 and Shanlin Rao, is put this together into a standard protocol. And, and um, indeed the software of this is, is, is now freely available. So what we do is we, we take our channel structure, we embed it in a lipid bilayer using some of the methods we've developed with coarse grain simulations to get the optimal location within a lipid bilayer. We carry out the simulations uh, 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 of the type that we've just seen. We can, we'll come back to this example, but you can see how it has, a, a again, a, a narrow hydrophobic region that we set as initially hydrated, but quickly during the simulation, it switches to a de-wetted state. And then um, Jani in, in the software has developed a rather nice and robust method for estimating the number density of waters along the pore axis. And so we can see on either side of the channel, it behaves roughly as bulk water with a density of 33 per nanometer cubed. And then when we go in the channel, the density drops. Um, there's just a, occasional waters in there. And, and so if we take the inverse of the Boltzmann equation, we can equate that den number density with a free energy barrier, which we can estimate to water permeating that region. So this is the narrow region of the channel. This is the, the, the full length of the membrane here. So we can, this software allows us uh, 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 robustly as we, to, to carry out what I mentioned in the previous slide, to, to use water as a proxy for predicting the conductive state of a channel. And because this has a large barrier to water, we will conclude that this was a, a close form of the channel. Now, this example I've just shown you was actually for a, a, a channel known as BEST1 or best trophin. Um, here, there's a couple of structures for this. There's relatively high re resolution structure transmembrane region and then this other region here. It's a, it's a, a calcium gated chloride channel. It has this narrow hydrophobic region that we saw previously with a ring of isoleucine residues and two rings of phenylalanine residues. Uh, uh, and if we look at the water density versus time, we can see that it's very low within this region. If we look at um, uh, uh, a diagram uh, uh, of the pore lining. So the other thing we did was to update the whole software. And there's now on the website, I just gave you the CHAP software, which gives you rather fancier pictures uh, uh, and estimates of the, 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 the pore lining. Um, you can see, uh, ignore this region here, but in, in this gate region, you can see it's narrow and hydrophobic. And you can compare the radius with that either of a hydrated or a naked chloride ion. The black line shows the wild type channel. And, and then one of the mutants that has been made and studied physiologically for this channel is replacing these hydrophobic side chains by alanine. That makes it a little wider, a little less hydrophobic. And the energetic barrier here to water is removed. And indeed, physiologically, that um, triple alanine mutant is a constitutively open channel. It doesn't close, uh, and that would correlate with removing that barrier. 
So we followed that up a little bit more, and these are purely now in silico mutations. To the best of our knowledge, these, these haven't be, be, been explored experimentally. Um, replacing the rings of side chains that we saw uh, by identical side chains, so either three rings of isoleucine, three rings of leucine, or three rings of a, a, a side chain of almost exactly the same size. So you can see for these three different in silico mutants, they have very similar pore radius profiles in this gate region, but of different polarity. And you can see the two hydrophobic side chains give an energetic barrier comparable to that of the wild type. Whereas if we replace it by the isosteric but polar asparagine side chain, we see the energetic barrier has largely disappeared. And we can even see this if we use a, a slightly smaller side chain. So now we have a, a ring of valines. So the pore will be a little bit wider, but still hydrophobic. And that retains a significant energetic barrier. Um, if we replace that by a threonine, where one of the methyl groups has been replaced by hydroxyl, again, the barrier disappears. So these simple in silico mutations emphasize that the, the nature of this hydrophobic bay gate will depend upon the size and polarity of the side chains in that in that pore. Now this is one example we already looked a little bit uh, at the 5-HT3 receptor. What we wanted to do was to go ahead and see whether this was a, 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 a more general phenomenon uh, and we benefited from the um, in, in increase in number of structures of ion channels available uh, and, and so we were able to go systematically through about 200 different channel structures. There's currently of the order of 600, 700 channel structures, but in terms of different types of channel, it, it, it comes down to just uh, around 200. And so this is particularly the work of Shanlin Rao using the, the, some of the, the methods and the software developed by, by Gianni. Uh, uh, and so here is just a, a montage of all the different channels Shanlin looked at. Um, we did exactly the same simulations uh, 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 as you saw. And then what we're doing here is plotting the height of the energetic barrier to water. So um, orange means there's a high barrier. It, it, it's desert-like, it's de-wetted. There's no water there. Um, blue means a very low barrier, it's hydrated. Um, and each um, region in a channel uh, uh, across all these channels uh, has been measured in terms of its local hydrophobicity and its radius. So if you st start in the de-wetted region uh, and go up here as the pore gets wider, even if hydrophobic, it hydrates. Or if you sit around a, a, a relatively narrow pore, if it's hydrophobic, it would be de-wetted. If you make it more polar, it will become hydrated. Uh, and, and we used a, um, an SVM just to classify these a little bit more objectively, and you, and you get a, a, a dividing line on this surface at about 1 kT between the open hydrated state and the de-wetted closed state. And here's the sort of, just as a reminder, the cartoons. This is the hydrated state, wet throughout. This is the closed state, dehydrated in the narrow hydrophobic region. But this is not now based upon analysis of a, a single channel or a single channel and a few mutants. This is across um, a, 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 a curated data set of, of, at the time, all the available high resolution channel structures. Now, what that enabled us to do is to ask the question, well, let's say we don't do a simulation. We've just got a new structure. Um, can we use this um, general, this global behavior of channels to predict the state of a channel? Uh, uh, and so that was the next stage of what we did. So this is now a, a very rapid way of doing prediction. You take the input structure, you use the CHAP software to identify the pore lining side chains to determine the radius and the hydrophobicity of each ring of side chains there. And then you plot those on um, uh, a graph corresponding to this surface. And we heard a, a very nice talk yesterday about the um, gating of MTHK. So last night, Shanlin went back and had a look at the 
um, two structures, the, the closed and one of the open structures for MTHK. If we look at the closed structure, these points here represent um, the individual residues down at that um, bundle crossing gate, which are both where the pore is both narrow and hydrophobic. And so what we can do is come up with a score for the channel structure, what we refer to as a heuristic score, where we measure for those um, points that lie on the dehydrated side of the dividing line we saw from the earlier analysis. So sit over here on this energy surface. We measure their distance from that boundary, and then we add up the distance we sum the distance for all of those and that gives us our score. A score of 1.2 is definitely closed. Our, our cutoff based upon a sort of um, a, a, a more rigorous analysis of the, the training data set, our cutoff is about 0.5 for this. So this is most definitely closed. If we look at the uh, one of the open state structures in the presence of calcium, then um, none of the points line this corner, and so those are clearly open. So what this enables us to do, and we could, uh, or, or anybody working on structure channels to do, is you can go through this extremely quickly as soon as you've got the structure and come up with what we think is a um, uh, quite a, an accurate prediction of the state of the channel. And we tested this compared to simply looking at the radius profile on the basis of the old hole plots uh, uh, and it, it gives you a significantly better prediction accuracy. So that's what, what one of the things we, we, we've done by this sort of global analysis but now I want to look at a, a little bit more detail at um, some of the properties of water within these pores and um, I'm just going to pause and uh, one of the things we've repeatedly done over the past few years, often prompted by reviewers of papers, is worry about whether the water model that's used in the simulations has any effect. On the, on, so how robust are our results to water model? And most simulation studies uh, 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 of channels use um, some of the well-established uh, old favorite water models, either TIP3P, USB-CE, or, or so on. But as you're aware, there are many different water models, uh, 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 and Charlotte Lynch looked at, has been looking at these in some detail. And in particular, we were interested in, was there a difference in performance between fixed charge water model, models and polarizable water models? Now, there are a variety of polarizable models. Uh, we looked at a, a, a polarizable multiple, mo multiple model within Amoeba. There's the Jude oscillator model with it, with, within Charm, um, which we looked at a little bit, but most of our results are from Amoeba. And, what we wanted to know is we are aware that the, the polarizable models are much more computationally expensive. So if we use those, do, do, we, do we gain any additional understanding or will our results sta stand with, with the conventional models? Uh, and, and so this was work um, by, by, by Gianni and others. Um, uh, and, and we went back to the 5-HT3 receptor that I, I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and since we did that initial study, there have been a number of other structure determinations. So the one we looked at earlier was a closed state, but there's also been open states determined for this pore. And you see here the, 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 the um, diagrams from CHAP of the pore radius, the hydrophobicity. Uh, uh, and here in the um, open state, you can see that in the Lucy 9 prime region, that's shown here. The pore is a little bit wider, um, so we can see the, the hydrophobicity is maintained, but the, the dimensions of the pore seem to change in that hydrophobic region. And so we had available to us at the time four structures, three different closed ones, an open state structure, and we looked at a number of standard water models, the, the, the older one, TIP3P, um, TIP4P, uh, 2005, which reproduces well many of the properties of bulk water and the polarizable model in amoeba. And, and we wanted to know whether polarizability changed things. Now, the first thing we did was because the polarizable models are quite expensive, we instead of looking at the complete channel po protein, we looked at a model nanopore corresponding to um, 
just this region here. So there are five helices. This is a pentameric structure, just two are shown here. And so we're taking a ring of five helices in the membrane um, and we're restraining that helix bundle so it maintains the same overall shape as in the protein as a whole. And that just saves us a little bit of computational time. So our first question was, is it safe to do that? So we'll take one of the closed and the open structure and we'll look at the number density of water as a function of position along the membrane, uh, along the bilayer normal. So as a function of position along the z-axis, the number density of water. Uh, uh, and this is the transmembrane region in gray. And the full channel protein is shown by the yellow line. The model nanopore, the stripped back simplified version is shown by the blue line. And we can see that for the closed state, the, the profiles overlap almost identically. And even for the open state, which you'd expect to be a little bit more sensitive, within the errors between multiple simulations, the differences are relatively small. So at least with respect to this property of hydrophobic gating in these pentameric ligand gated ion channels, we can use this um, simple model nanopore rather than the whole, whole channel protein. Um, so now let's look at this versus different force fields. So here's a slice through the system, water, membrane, the, 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 the M2 pentameric nanopore. This is the, the hydrophobic narrow region. And here you can see for three different closed state models, one open state model, for four different water models, two um, standard fixed charge models, two polarizable models. You can see, um, firstly, that the number density profiles in the closed states are all very similar. So um, our conclusion is that all the closed state structures remain de-wetted, whichever water model we used. So that was that that that, that was um, quite quite a relief that uh, you know our, our whole theory of hydrophobic gating would not collapse if we brought in polarizability. Um, you see some variation for the open state in the degree of wetting according to the model you look at. And for the polarizable models, um, so the top two lines here, this is the overall degree of wetting. Um, so one would be fully de-wet, fu fully liquid water, zero would be fully vapor. You can see for the two polarizable models, it's almost fully wet. Um, there's more variation between simulations for the fixed point charge models. So um, the hydration probability of the open structure does show a little bit of sensitivity to, to the to water model. Now we pursued this in a little bit more detail. We wanted to see, for example, if we took the open state of the pore and then um, calculated the potential of mean force for an iron moved through that pore. So I'm just showing here just two subunits of the pore, I've missed out the membrane and everything. And this is just showing the iron with its first hydration shell um, going along this reaction coordinate. We, we can look at the, 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 the nature of the potential amine force if I take either a sodium or a chloride ion through there. And this is a, a cation selective channel. So we can see um, for sodium, um, if we use tip 3 p there's a small barrier. Uh, 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 and then around this ring of negatively charged side chains, which will be at this mouth of the pore, there's a well. So this is contributing um, to the, the, the cation selectivity of the overall pore. Remember, this is just of the, 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 the simplified nanopore. So this is for tip 3P. If we do the same thing for the polarizable model, we see that the overall shape is broadly similar. There's now uh, a, a well corresponding also to this ring of negative side chains here, but you get a much more rugged landscape. And I think you'd expect that if instead of fixed charges, you have polarizability, then the local environment of the iron will adjust to the presence or absence of the iron. And so you'd expect a, a, a slightly more rugged free energy landscape as you take the iron through. If we take chloride through, we can see firstly a much higher barrier, which we'd expect. Um, this favorable interaction for the sodium ion has disappeared and has become as expected a, 
uh, a barrier. And also for chloride, we see a much more rugged interaction, particularly as we take the, um, the chloride ion out through the most hydrophobic region. Now, Jani looked at this in a little bit more detail and investigated, amongst other things, the, um, the hydration number of the ions as it went through. And that was one of the things that differed very much for the, for the chloride ions uh, between the fixed point charge and the polarizable model. <coughs> so with the polarizable model, if we look at the ion going through the narrowest hydrophobic region of the channel, then the ion um, showed a, a, a lower hydration number and there seemed to be an interaction between the hydrophobic surface of the channel and the ion, where the hydrophobic surface is displacing some of, of the chloride ions, even though there was space to accommodate most of those. And that seemed to be particularly a property of, of the polarizable model. Now that reminded us uh, uh, of some older data on hydrophobic, in inverted commas, solvation of anions. There's a literature from, amongst others, um, Doug Tobias uh, uh, and Pavel Jungwirth on, on, on halide ions at water hydrophobic interfaces. Um, so either water air interface, and Doug was interested in modeling water dro seawater droplets in air, or water hydrophobic solvent interfaces. Uh, and for those, it suggested that polarizability um, matters. And so we've been looking at this in a little bit more detail, particularly with some of the um, models developed by, by, by Young Earth and colleagues. Uh, and this is the work of Linda Fan. And I'm not going to say much more about this because she has a poster here at the meeting. And so I'll leave her to t talk to you about it. But this um, suggests that, the, that we should pursue in more detail um, the of the importance of tracking polarizability or of using polarizability when st studying water within ion channels, particularly we think in the context uh, of channels that are selected for chloride ions. But go, go, go and see Linda's poster to find out a bit more about this. So this is but largely by way of an advert. Okay, back to the 5-HT3 receptor. Um, the, 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 the model poor shown here. One of the other things we're interested in is most of our simulations are in the absence of any voltage across the membrane. And when we talk, talked about hydrophobic gating in the past and, and, uh, and looked at the comments on various, various papers, there were two things reviewers um, consistently raised and two sets of questions we consistently asked. One was the effect of polarizability, so we looked a little bit at that. And then the other was, what happens when you put a voltage across the membrane? Because there's a considerable physical chemistry literature on, on, on taking, say, water in a hydrophobic nano slit between two um, uh, planar hydrophobic surfaces, and then looking at how you can wet, de-wet that region by changing the voltage difference between those two plates. So what happens if we take this system, we've got our channel in a membrane, and we can put a, a, a voltage difference across that, we can put a, 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 an E-field across the, the system, and can we go from at equilibrium, this is de-wetted, so it'd be a system such as we've just been examining for the closed state of the 5-HT3 receptor, and then we impose a voltage across that, is that sufficient to uh, wet that pore? Uh, and, and indeed, we'd shown in principle that would work for proteins. Um, I don't have the slide here, but some earlier work that Gemma Trick did on simplified models of protein nanopores suggested that you could, um, by putting a, a sufficiently high voltage, you could wet a hydrophobic gate in a model beta barrel. But we wanted to look at it for this rather more realistic structure. So that's what Gianni did. And I'll, I'll just summarize the results here. This is then the hydration state from dry to wet of the closed state of the 5-HT3 receptor we saw previously as a function of the applied um, electrostatic field. So you can see we've put the, uh, given here the electrostatic field in millivolts per nanometer. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But what we can see is that in the absence of any voltage across the membrane, the pore is de-wetted, 
if we take the voltage up high enough, it fully wets. Uh, and we can do a little bit of theory to explain that by filling um, the empty volume with a high dielectric medium with, 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 with water. That's embedded here in this equation here. Um, we can do the same thing for the open state of the channel, and we can see that for this particular water model, I think this is actually for tip 3P, um, that it's largely wet even at equilibrium, but we can fully wet it by increasing the voltage. And you can see that here. So here, we th th this is for the closed state, hardly wet at all in the absence of voltage, and we can switch it to, to wet at either of the two voltages, positive or negative. Now, the so, so that was interesting, but from a physiological point of view, you have to think not about the, the strength of the field, but what voltage across the membrane that will correspond to. And if we do the calculation for this, this corresponds to a voltage of about 800 millivolts. So that's eight, about eight times the physiological voltage. So it's well above physiological voltage. So this is something that I think is probably important in designed nanopores, and there are examples of that in non-biological systems, for example, from Susanna Zewi's work, um, but probably is not, a, a, for this system, a, a physiological relevance. Okay, I should maybe just finish off by trying to come back to biological and physiological systems and exemplify how we've been able to use some of this theoretical work now for new structures. This is our, our, our studies along the side uh, a sort of Chakopane's group looking at new structures of the glycine receptor, both in an apostate state and a state which um, is has the ligands that activates the channel, glycine present, and it's locked in an open state by having a toxin present as well. You can see here the channel's a little bit wider at the leucine nine region, nine prime region, uh, and we can study this. Um, showing this slide to show how we can study this at three different levels. So as soon as the, the structures are available, one can use the heuristic approach I outlined earlier based upon Shanlin's global analysis of channels and within therefore a matter of, well, a few seconds, less than a second of compute time and just a few minutes of student time, um, we, 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 we can say that this is definitely a closed state. This goes back to our heuristic score. This is significantly um, greater than the threshold. So this is a, a closed state of the channel in the absence of glycine. This state is clearly open. So we can do our initial prediction straight off the back of the structure. We can do the simulations of water density and convert that into free energy. That can be done in a, a, a matter of a few days with a number of repeat simulations. And again, show that in the closed state, the L9 prime gate is closed. There's a significant barrier to water, but that's removed in this open state. Or we can apply a transmembrane voltage. This is now a physiological voltage um, and, and just track ions going across the pore in the presence of voltage. And the, the, dark, the, the, the intermediate blue here are chloride ions. We can see in the closed state of the channel, ions don't cross. The very pale blue is water. There's even a gap for water corresponding to this gate. But in the presence, uh, 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 in the open state of the channel, we can see that a number of chlorides go back and forth across the pore. And you can start to try to relate that in the way, for example, Bert Hoot has for, for various potassium channels. You can try then to relate that to the conductance of the channel. And I've dwelled a little bit on applying this methodology to members of the ligand-gated iron channel family, but just to finish to show it could be used for other pores, this is some recent work in collaboration with Tim Rasmussen's uh, 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 and, and colleagues, looking at various new structures for homologs of MSCS. MSCS um, early on was suggested to be in a a closed state with a dehydrated gate. Um, if we use our methods, we, 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 we would suggest similarly that MSCS, the structure corresponds to a closed state. Uh, uh, and then these newer structures using the same approach, we can 
classify these as open. And this one is, is intermediate. It's partially dehydrated. And so probably closer to closed than to open. So the, the methodology is applicable to a wider range of channels. Okay, I should finish there and, uh, and summarize. So I think we now know that this theory of hydrophobic gating um, can apply to a number of iron channel families, not all families, but it, but, but it, it, it is certainly valid and exploited by evolution. We've shown it can be applied to new channel structures. I've shown this for um, the glycine receptor and also for these MSCS homologs. Electrowetting, um, we don't think that's physiologically significant, but we think it could be exploited in nanopore design. Um, and future directions, as I said, we'd like to know more about anions and the importance of polarizability. Uh, 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 and also Charlotte Lynch is particularly interested in um, multi-level description of water in pores. We looked at additive models, polarizable models, and that we, we, we should also look at quantum mechanical models as well. Um, I'll finish off by thanking everybody in my group. I've tried to acknowledge the individual players as we've go, got along. Thank my uh, experimental collaborators who, who provide structures and who, who, who keep us asking what we hope are physiologically relevant questions and um, thank the various agencies for funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for this inspiring talk. And there are uh, lots of questions from the audience. So Alberto Giacomello is asking, how do you measure the hydrophobicity of the pore? Will different choices of the hydrophobicity scale change the predictivity of the model? Yeah, that, 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 that's a, 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 a very good question. So one of the things um, uh, Shan Lin did were, was to see how robust the, the, um, the, the model was to different hydrophobicity scales. I think we used four or five different hydrophobicity Fabicity scales. The one you've seen in the, in the slides is the Wimley White hydrophobicity scale, but um, broadly the results were were quite robust to to using different hydrophobicity scales, which which was reassuring. Okay, so Simone Meloni is asking, what about novel neural network force fields? A case studies show that they can be very accurate with respect to a initial data they are trained on. They embody polarization, but each bonding in a initial is not always very accurate. I'd like to know your opinion. Um, I, I think it would be very interesting to, to, to explore them. We, ha we haven't done that. Um, we've looked a little bit at the, uh, instead of a polarizable model at um, Youngworth's approximation to that is ECC model, and Linda has some results on that. But uh, I, I, I think it, it would, I, I think one could use the behavior of water in a nanopore, which I think now we do do understand at a certain level. We could use that as, uh, if you like, a, a test bed for how these newer force fields behave. That would be very interesting. Okay, so uh, Antonio Tinti is asking, thanks for the impressive talk. Have you considered the effect of dissolved chemicals, e.g. small hydrophobic molecules, on the phase behavior of water oh. inside the inner section of the pore? No. Um, and I, 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 I guess that might be of interest from a pharmacological perspective. Um, that, that, I, that actually takes me way back to when I was a graduate student and did experiments on protein crystallization by adding alcohols to, to water. Um, no, we haven't done that, but that would, that would also be very interesting to know how, you know, presence of non-aqueous solvents alongside water uh, change the, the, the hydrophobic gating. Haven't done that, but that would be very interesting. Perfect. So there are two questions by Lucide Lemotte. So the first one is, thanks for chat, Mark. We really like it. Question. Structure can be trapped in artificial states. I assume hydrophobic parts are particularly sensitive to the environment. Do you trust the structure or use MD sims to try and find more physiological states before using chap? The question is maybe particularly tricky given the imperfection of force field. 
yeah so um i think that's a very good question uh, 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 and as many you know there's been a an ongoing discussion of um possible non-physiological states of the glycine receptor which motivates some of some of our collaboration with with, with, with sudha's group um we we have two ways in which we approach the problem one is slightly more um conservative in terms of um in in terms of the structure which is to say so in the simulations looking at the, the different structures we restrain the backbone of the protein and the reason behind that was we wanted to ask the question if we take the experimental structure do we predict that to be open or closed without allowing for conformational change so that's obviously a, a relatively simple question um a, a, a one we can ask quite quickly but there, then there's the, the as it were the more um, important more complex question of is this state in a crystal structure or a cryo-EM structure is it stable or it, when I, we look at that in a simulation is it going to undergo a conformational change clearly you can do that you can look at that on um, either via sort of brute force long time scale simulations or, or various approaches to enhance sampling um, I think for the for for the structure we showed in the presence of glycine and picrotoxin for the glycine receptor, when we take the restraints off, that still remains um, open. Whether it's the physiological state requires us to back calculate what the, the the conductance of the channel would be, and I think that is still quite difficult. Um, in and that's the other motivation for looking at different iron and water models is to see which, which force field will allow us to best reproduce by computational electrophysiology approaches the known experimental conductance so then in principle we should be able to go take structure calculate conductance and compare that to experiment to see whether that particular structure does correspond to that particular open state of a channel and again we heard a little bit about that um, interplay between molecular dynamic simulations and rate-based models for KCSA yesterday. So I think that becomes the real test, but unfortunately I'm not sure the simulations are yet, we're not yet certain enough about, about the quality of the force fields for ions and water to say we can do that with sufficient accuracy, make that prediction, to discriminate say between different multiple conducting states of the channel. Sorry, that's a rather rather long answer, but uh, that, that sketches where we are. Thank you, Mark, for the exhaustive answer. Indeed, <laughs> there are other questions by Roland Roth, uh, Jaroslav Grosu, and uh, Gerard Thiel, but I'm afraid you will have to answer in the private chat because we are already running late. So uh, we thank Mark again.